So thank you to the Ilios Foundation and to John and to Andy for having me here this afternoon to speak with you about deploying assets to empower agents of change. I started my career in the world of philanthropy. I was a program officer at a family foundation. And so we were very focused on maximizing social and environmental impact. Um, and that was uh, the exclusive focus. We, we didn't speak about um, investing the corpus consistently with values. It was the early 90s. That was just not on the, uh, the radar of traditional philanthropy. Uh, but I started getting frustrated with the level of impact that I could make uh, through the philanthropic sector and became much more interested in how to leverage uh, for-profit business to create social good and to invest in social entrepreneurs to do so. And so I decided to uh, apply to business school. So I went from the, uh, the, the, the wonderful and uh, warm world of philanthropy uh, to the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the somewhat challenging, always uh, aggressive, always competitive classrooms of Harvard Business School. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking about the Venn diagram that Andy just laid out, and, and there was just you know, one circle of the, of the Venn diagram at HBS, especially at that time. So I was there from 1996 to 1998, and we were focused exclusively on maximizing shareholder value. So um, I, I think about a, a piece that Milton Friedman wrote for the New York Times Magazine in 1979, about 32 years ago, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but, but not really not too much. And he uh, said in that article, the social purpose of business was to maximize shareholder value without breaking the law. And uh, that was the kind of gestalt at Harvard Business School at that time. And so as you might imagine, I um, had some, some cognitive dissonance, kind of coming from the world of mission returns and being thrown into the deep end of the pool around uh, financial returns and the financial capital markets. At that time, there was something called the Initiative on Social Enterprise at HBS. It was founded by John Whitehead, who you may remember was one of the chairmen of Goldman Sachs. But at that time, the whole notion of social entrepreneurship was very much focused on professionalizing the nonprofit sector, about bringing the business tools and techniques of the, the for-profit sector to the nonprofit sector. Having come from that world, I was much more interested in how to bring the mission and principles of the nonprofit sector to the for-profit sector. Um, and that, there were no case studies on that. Um, I don't know if Whole Foods even existed back then. I certainly didn't go to it. And, um, and, and so it was a very bifurcated world. I mean, you make your money one way, you give your money back uh, through philanthropic mechanisms um, later in life. And so, as a way of kind of reconciling this cognitive dissonance, if you will, I, I wrote a paper for my venture capital private equity professor, this fellow named Josh Lerner, which may, he may be familiar to some of you. He's a very um, well-published author um, around the alternative asset classes. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard. He's a perfect market theory man. No good deal goes on unfunded. Very much a, a proponent of, of Milton Friedman, as was you know, most of the school at that time. And uh, you can imagine this class. It's 1998, and we had to write a paper. We had to select a, a paper topic. And folks are writing about David Swenson at the Yale um, uh, endowment and his practice around um, a very successful, financially successful practice of managing the endowment. Um, other folks were very excited about the then exploding hedge fund industry. And so it was really a class about the alternative asset class and folks were writing papers about that. And I decided instead to write a meditation on the nature of value. So <laughs> how does value get created in our society? And when I thought of value, I meant financial value, certainly, but also economic value, social value, environmental value. So looking at the world in a more holistic way. And I am going to, to use some of the frameworks and principles and thinking of that paper as a way of uh, sharing with you some of my ideas about impact investing. Um, since that time, since graduation, I've either been operating, consulting, or investing in mission-driven businesses, and I'm going to talk to you about some of those experiences um, in a moment. 
So I wrote this paper about the trade-off between financial and impact returns. And you can imagine uh, that Josh Lerner was uh, befuddled by my selection of topic. Um, but I was really excited about it. <laughs> and uh, so I uh, developed a framework where I looked at financial returns on the x-axis and impact returns, both social and environmental, on the y-axis, and tried to consider the range of private investments, with, if investments with air quotes, um, private investments that someone can make to create value in the world, from a philanthropist making a quote-unquote investment in a nonprofit organization to straight venture capital private equity without a particular focus on social or environmental mission. Um, so I started out with philanthropy, um, and indeed I started my career in philanthropy. Um, as I said earlier, I was a program officer at a family foundation. Um, although I think now that we were practicing a more animated uh, version of philanthropy that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so when I thought about philanthropy here in the context of this paper, I was thinking about a very traditional approach to philanthropy, nothing like what Elios does, and nothing like a, even a, a, a very creative grant-making organization does. I, I call it checkbook philanthropy, and it sounds pejorative, and it is a tiny bit pejorative. It's basically, you know, I'm gonna you know, write a check to my alma mater, I'm gonna write a check to the ballet, to the opera, not that those aren't worthy um, organizations, but basically, I'm gonna write the check, not do too much due diligence, I get their C3 status, so I know I get my tax write off and I'm done with it. So it's, it's kind of no questions asked philanthropy. I, I, can, I kind of consider that old school philanthropy, if you will. So in, that, in, in the framework, we are creating um, relatively high impact returns, um, uh, or somewhat high impact returns, um, and really no financial returns, although the, the finance folks in the audience would say, oh, there's you know, a tiny tax shield that you get that could be argued back to every single grant. But for the most part, it's, it's, it's an investment made with the intention of uh, creating social and environmental impact. And then we have venture capital or private equity um, uh, on the other end of the spectrum where you're maximizing financial returns and we could also uh, you know, have a spirited debate about whether uh, you know, venture capital creates social and environmental impact and I mean traditional Silicon Valley style venture capital and you could say you know, the internet created you know, increased productivity and isn't that a social return? Yes, but when I think about impact I mean impact by design, not by accident. So when I, when I think about the kind of work that I did at the foundation, it was the Peter Norton Family Foundation uh, before business school, I really think we were practicing something called venture philanthropy, which is a term you may or may not be familiar with, but it kind of came about you know, roughly in the you know, early to mid-90s, um, at the time when Silicon Valley money was thinking about, okay, how can we adapt the relational forms of venture capital to, uh, to philanthropic um, investing? And I think back on what, the work we did at the Peter Norton Family Foundation, and I think that that was really uh, venture philanthropy. I would sit on the board of foundations, uh, pardon me, on, on, of nonprofits. Um, I would help them with their strategic plan. We would think about how they could raise money. Um, so we were really trying to, I was trying to add value the way a venture capital partner adds value to a portfolio company. Again, we didn't call it venture philanthropy, and I put it higher up than regular philanthropy because I felt that that was uh, kind of a more compelling offer in terms of social and environmental return on investment. Um, I plotted something called virtuous capital, which is really a, kind of a cute name for community development venture capital, which is um, uh, venture capital investing to typically to create jobs in the inner city and rural communities. And so the idea here is you're putting at-risk folks to work, um, and above and beyond the jobs, you're maybe creating um, additional, like a social multiplier effects, secondary and tertiary impacts um, as a result. And I felt like, you know, done correctly, community development venture capital could deliver phila philanthropy style or exceed philanthropy style um, mission impact, but also deliver a financial return, albeit a, not a sufficiently risk adjusted rate of financial return because it's private equity, it's super risky, and maybe you're getting kind of low. Uh, low to, uh, well, high to low, um, high single digits to low uh, double digits um, there. And so I had some experience with that after business school. I worked in the community development venture capital arm of Bank Boston, 
which turned into Fleet Boston, which turned into Bank of America. Um, but at that time, there was a community development venture capital group that was investing CRA credits according to census tracts. And so we were looking at women and minority-owned businesses and, and businesses in the, in, their, in the inner city and how we could create um, hybrid equity and um, hi hybrid debt and equity products uh, to, to spur that growth and to create jobs and economic um, development in the inner city and, um, and, in, and, and in rural communities. So that was a, a, a great experience. I, I, when I was at uh, business school, I did a year-long field study on women entrepreneurs' access to equity capital. And the um, analysis is very similar to minority um, entrepreneurs' access to equity capital, which um, if any of you are interested in after um, I speak, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it. But I felt that, um, you know, remember I was in a community where no, deal go no good deal goes unfunded, and I actually felt that that was not the case, that there was kind of a market inefficiency or a market uh, failure around women and minority-owned businesses that could deliver near venture capital style uh, financial returns, but also there had been a lot of studies at that time to suggest that women and minority-owned businesses run, um, have uh, business practices that um, are more progressive, more flexible work time, paid volunteerism, and so the thought is that above and beyond kind of uh, uh, bridging the market failure in, in, in funding women and minority-owned businesses, that, uh, that, that they actually create some social or environmental impact in a, in a different way. And so, um, so, so that it was plotted kind of as near, um, uh, near venture returns, but, but substantial impact returns. And then finally, I plotted social and environmental venture capital. Um, until relatively recently, I was managing director of a venture capital and venture acceleration firm in Southern California called Funk Ventures. And it's a market rate shop. So we sought to achieve risk-adjusted rates of, of financial return for the asset class, which you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer, uh, what the risk-adjusted rate of, of financial return for the asset class will be now because the markets are doing some wild things and that affects the private equity markets. But at that time, the expectation was mid-20s IRR. And so we were going for that. Um, but we would only invest in industries where we felt we could get, where social and environmental impact was baked into the, uh, the company itself. So, uh, for example, we invested in clean technology, uh, sustainability, health and wellness, uh, and medical technology. And so here is where we felt like, and, and, and remember, I was writing this in 1998. Today, I actually think that this could be pushed almost all the way out here, where you could deliver, if you have a market rate posture, you could deliver risk-adjusted rates of financial return, as well as near philanthropy style impacts. And this is, this is why I went to business school, right, was to figure out, like, how can I invest in those social entrepreneurs who will deliver a very high financial value, but also very high social social and environmental um, impact in a sustainable way, to Andy's point earlier, that there's, you know, th that if the business model is sustainable, that the, the social and environmental returns would be enduring. And so I, I felt like I had, you know, worked along this, I, I have worked along this entire spectrum. So here is the argument I had with Josh Lerner about this, this uh, model or this kind of uh, framework, if you will. Um, Josh Lerner felt that if there was a curve that connected philanthropy and venture capital, that it would be um, concave. Meaning that if you take social and environmental impact into account, you by definition will be suboptimizing financial return. I didn't agree. I thought that there was this kind of new world efficient frontier where you could actually invest in a way that would, could deliver near venture style financial returns and near uh, philanthropy, um, social and environmental impact. And so um, we thought about it and uh, he didn't agree with me. And that was pretty fun, you know, to, to, to debate with him. Um, I went back to HBS for my 10 year reunion a couple years ago, and he gave a lecture on the state of venture capital. And I went up afterwards and I said, you know, Josh, do you remember me? I <laughs> wrote that wild paper on the nature of value in your venture capital class. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. I said, you gave me a good grade on it, even though you didn't agree with it, which I thought was pretty great. Well, I'm working at a venture capital firm now that's seeking to prove this, that's seeking to say that there is a, a type of investing that can deliver a, a very, very strong basket of blended returns. And um, <laughs> he said to me, well, that's great. 
get back to me when you have your portfolio returns, which was not entirely surprising, right? I mean, he wants to know the devil's in the numbers for him. He doesn't care if I create jobs. He doesn't care if I save gallons of water. He just wants to know, <laughs> did I hit this? But, but could I hit this while also you know, being on this axis? I think so. And uh, even though he wasn't necessarily interested in the impact returns, um, you know, th that is what uh, you know, we seek to deliver in the impact investing space is a, is a, is a blend of, of those two. Um, so, so one of my, my kind of conclusions of this paper is that you know, this is out here in the upper, um, you know, upper right-hand quadrant, that there's, there's, there's some real work to be done here. Um, but the, the second conclusion also kind of flew in the face of, of uh, the kind of the gestalt at HBS. And in, in fact, the incumbent model of wealth accumulation and transfer. So I was trying to reject in this paper the notion that you should make your money down here, whether it's venture capital or you know, public or private debt and equity, whatever it is, but that you make a lot of money even if it means in so doing you're creating negative social and environmental capital. And then you start a charitable foundation with a small percentage of your money. And oh, by the way, you, know, you pay out 5% in terms of grants, but the 95%, the corpus, is invested without regard to the mission, thereby effectively doing net negative mission impact. So you're, doing, you're making a lot of money here, but you're creating a lot of negative social and environmental capital. And then you're transferring it here, for which you get a tax break. And, and, but you're actually doing probably net negative. So if I have a $100 million foundation and I, you know, I'm sprinkling my grants around to environmental uh, nonprofits, but in, I'm invested in British Petroleum, that you know, my, the 95%, you know, the, the gross majority of my assets are mobilized across purposes, consciously or not, uh, across purposes to the, to the, to the grant making. You know, what does that say about the, the, the overall nature of value creation? I know, by the way, there's kind of the, we talk about the time value of money in finance. There's a time value of, of the social and environmental problems. By the time you are trying to solve these problems up here, there's been, what, you know, 25, 30, 40 years. And the problems have only got worse, and they've gotten more expensive to solve. And oh, by the way, you've made them worse in, in creating your money in this way, um, potentially. And, not, and not, not, uh, not necessarily intentionally, just by, by not paying attention to it, you're sort of you know, participating um, in this kind of uh, what I call the robber baron method of wealth accumulation and transfer. And so what I was calling for in this paper was a new model of simultaneous wealth creation, where you take, I'm not saying take 100% of your assets, and when I say 100% of your assets, I mean your time, your energy, and your capital. Don't take 100%, take 5%, take 50%. If you the Elios Foundation, take 100%. And try to create simultaneous wealth creation by investing up here, where you are not kind of creating the problem, a big, big problem, part, helping to create the problem, and then putting like a tiny Band-Aid on it 40 years hence. So um, this is what I was uh, selling Josh Lerner, <laughs> and he was not buying, but I was. And when I look at this, I think, well, you know, you write it 13 years ago, you kind of read your old papers, and you think, oh, what was I thinking? I, when I read this paper, I think this is my career blueprint. Like, this is, this is what um, kind of presaged my um, entry into impact investing. So, so I went ahead and called this um, an impact efficient frontier. For those of you who are in finance, you know that, that an efficient frontier means something very specific to you, that there is a risk reward trade off, and that when you, an efficient portfolio, um, you are selecting investments that for, the, there, there's a better investment that you can select with the same risk level, select that one, and then you're on the efficient frontier. So the shape looks different. I know you're, you know, those of you in the financial capital markets are used, used to looking at a hyperbola. Um, but uh, I was went ahead and called this boldly the impact efficient frontier. And there are factors that are pulling this curve out. And they are a range of social, environmental, regulatory, technological, demographic, psychographic driving forces, and we know what they are. 
And when I kind of itemize them, a lot of people think that you know, they're the doom and gloom factors. The folks, you know, as impact investors, we look at these factors and we see that this is an opportunity to make change and to make money. And the financial capital folk guys are the, and gals in the, in the, uh, in the uh, audience ought to also see that there's an opportunity to make money here. And there's also an opportunity to do good. Um, so what are these factors? You know them. It's uh, increasing population, population growth, increasing incidence of poverty, uh, increasing incidence of, uh, of public health challenges like diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease. And oh, by the way, when we are passing off our diet to developing economies and even to other developed economies, they're, they're, they're suffering from you know, the, some of the same public health challenges that we do. Um, so there are health challenges. The baby boomers are coming. <laughs> are, we're, the, we're here and we're living a really long time. Um, we have a lack of access to clean water and to fresh food, especially in the inner city and rural communities and certainly in emerging markets. Um, on the environmental side, we have climate change. We have uh, an aging water and electrical infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, gyrating <laughs> oil and natural gas prices. Um, the list goes on. Um, so, so again, these sound like kind of huge intractable problems, but putting on your strategic philanthropy hat and also putting on your impact investing hat, this is the kind of stuff we live for. Like, we, we're not going to solve these problems by just mobilizing 5% of our endowments a year. We need to mobilize our corpuses. We need to mobilize our taxable income. We need to mobilize our time and our energy um, and array them in a strategic way to make a dent in some of these issues. And oh, by the way, make some money too while we're at it. But there are also factors that are bringing the curve kind of back to the point of origin. Um, one of them is kind of the incumbent model, the Robert Barron method of wealth accumulation and then transfer. But another factor is impact investing and some barriers to scale. So Andy talked a little bit about impact investing. Some of you may know a bit about impact investing. Some of you are practitioners of impact investing. But as you know, it's a nascent world. It's a nascent community and a nascent practice, the social capital markets, and uh, typified by highly fragmented supplies of capital, uh, including, you know, uh, there aren't that many products uh, available, even for high net worth individuals, let alone retail investors. Uh, there's a lot of single manager risk. So there aren't a lot of products that are diversifying manager risk. We have fragmented uh, demand for capital. So the kinds of deals that the Elios Foundation is doing or these the small bespoke deals in country, they release a lot of value. But if we want to mobilize institutional capital into this space, we need to figure out how to kind of roll this all up and maybe productize it, could bring the demand together to create an opportunity that you know, a CalPERS would even look at. You know, CalPERS doesn't get out of bed for less than, you know, $100 billion. And so, and when, you know, you guys are doing these deals in country, you know, it's these small bespoke deals. I call them blood on the term sheet deals, as Andy knows, of Andy's blood, where he is structuring in country and, and then and selling it and, and it, you know, this dogged pursuit of the close. And um, we have to do things in impact investing to kind of make Andy's life easier. Uh, so we have fragmented supply of capital, fragmented demand for capital, a dearth of intermediaries, a dearth of products. Um, we are not sure as, a, as an industry, we don't have uh, standards the way we have, um, the way we have GAP and Morningstar and S&P. We're, we're starting to have some standards, some reporting standards, um, some measurement practices, uh, some assurance functions, but it's nascent. Um, so for, for the financial capital markets folks in the industry, you know, you, we look at a plot of, a, of an industry like that, oh my god, highly fragmented supplies of capital, highly fragmented demand for capital, like this is ripe for, a, this is ripe for intervention. And, um, and so if we can ease some of the barriers to scale, we can allow these social and envir environmental driving forces to increase the, both the need to solve these problems but also the financial opportunity to do so. Um, so I, I will uh, end, wrap up uh, with my, my current position, because I talked about almost all my other positions as I kind of worked around the efficient frontier, but now I'm working here, uh, trying to ease the impact um, investing 
barrier. So I'm managing director of investments for a nonprofit financial institution called Impact Assets, which was a spinoff from the Calvert Foundation in 2009. And we exist to uh, increase the flow of capital into impact investing through thought leadership and through innovative product development and, and, and structuring. And so, you know, we see fragmented supplies and demand for capital and lack of intermediaries and a lack of product and, you know, the, the desire of, of financial advisors to offer products to their clients that are diversified and risk adjusted. And that's what we're doing. That's our contribution. So just in closing, and then we can move to, um, to Q&A, some concluding thoughts. So it's my, my feeling that the exclusive fixation on short-term returns, managing to um, Wall Street analysts' expectation, has contributed to the current economic crisis. But there are definitely signs of hope. The social capital markets are evolving nicely. Um, so these key market barriers that I talked about are being addressed. Uh, foundations like the Elios Foundation and others are looking for impact beyond grant making, how to mobilize their capital for good. And further, financial institutions and some, some big investment banks and investors are beginning to see the returns opportunities. Yes, the impact opportunities, but also the returns opportunities presented by impact investing. Um, on the financial capital market side, we know that corporations are, are receiving increased pressure on social issues and are seeing the cost benefit of sustainability. Uh, and and you know, we, can, we can argue about whether these CEOs are putting sustainability practices in place because it's the right thing or because it's going to save them money by squeezing money out of the supply chain. Either way, it's a good thing. Um, and uh, I, I don't think anytime soon we will have the political will in this country to push forward cap and trade or price carbon. But I tell you, the moment that we do, is the moment that environmental risk and reward will get priced in the, to, into the um, capital markets. It will happen overnight. And so one of the things, I worked on a project with Ashoka a couple summers ago to try to figure out, to try to map the social capital markets and figure out what is the social equivalent of cap and trade. So for those of you who are students in the audience, you, you know, that could be like a really cool paper topic that I, I would love to read your paper on that. Um, but the point is that the social capital markets and the financial capital markets are, 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 uh, are, are paying attention and, and uh, there's a lot of action there. And so my, my, my challenge to the audience is to consider the role that impact investing might play in your quest, yes, for social and environmental impact, but also your quest for financial returns. Thank you.